Okay, uh, it's time for that uh, ventilation uh, video. Uh, so I did take some notes uh, just to uh, to not forget some key points. I'm at my other yard right now. Uh, like I mentioned before, uh, it's kind of unfortunate because I most of my colonies are in doubles uh, and it's way too much volume and uh, I'll share some of the data that I do have on that but you'll see that uh, it does have an impact uh, so these are yeah they're doubles and one actually is a double and a, a medium why again just too busy uh, it is what it is so I'll, uh, I'll use it as a learning experience uh, so I do have temperature sensors in these boxes. I have one uh, in the top box, top of the top box, and one at the lower entrance. And then uh, we'll talk about uh, those uh, temperature differences with uh, outside temperature. So right now it's about minus 15 Celsius outside. Uh, we've been hovering between minus 30 and minus 10, minus 15. Uh, not too bad, a bit of snow right now, but... Uh, it's uh it's kind of interesting uh and then the other one is it looks like that hive with the co2 sensor and the o2 sensor it looks like it it's in the four percent range right now so the o2 sensor is around 18 percent uh down from about 22 and a half which is atmospheric so uh it's interesting and there is a correlation uh at values below 10,000 ppm so I'm using that to help me understand and make sure that there's a there is a correlation between the O2 level and CO2 level so enough uh, techie talk for now but uh, let's talk ventilation so why is ventilation important uh, so really it's about making sure that the gas is inside humid air uh, the bees have the oxygen they need to basically uh, generate heat, uh, run their metabolism. Uh, but you'll notice that bees are really resilient and they're able to uh, uh, to manage their internal environments at levels that would kill us humans. But uh, for bees, uh, they thrive in. So I did mention the uh, 4% uh, CO2. So that's an example of... Uh, hypoxia or the beginnings of hypoxia and hypoxia means lower oxygen levels so it's about four percent lower than atmospheric uh so bees are okay they can probably go down to about eight percent uh before they start worrying about things uh but uh yeah it'll be interesting to see where that hovers but the reason we have ventilation is one to, to help bring fresh air in but also evacuate uh, some of that used air and stagnant air uh, maybe excessive moisture in some cases and then uh, when co2 levels get too high uh, it's it's actually uh, a thing they need to manage so how does ventilation work so there's two configurations there's the one where uh, folks uh, put a top entrance and then there's a lower entrance and then you get a flow through air so that's one of the methods and then the other one is uh, lower entrance only and that's where uh, basically all the air is natural convection and it, it flows through uh, that bottom entrance incoming air goes through that bottom entrance and outgoing air goes through that bottom entrance so I'll, I'll start with uh, the things that actually drive uh, ventilation in general in our colonies so really, so in summer, the bees can fan. So they actually use their muscles, run their wings, and they're able to push air uh, so actively. So we call that forced ventilation. Uh, but in winter, most of it's passive. And it's the bees either using, uh, I guess, the stack or buoyancy effect. So literally, that's where the warm air wants to rise and then if you've got a top entrance it'll exit that top entrance uh so and, and then cooler air gets sucked in the bottom and there's a natural cycle there to get that you need a temperature difference and that temperature difference is actually what drives uh so moist warm air tends to rise uh it's lighter 
and colder air is heavier. So basically the lighter goes up, it evacuates the top, and then it slowly sucks in uh, air from the bottom. And that's pretty much ventilation in a nutshell. So when you have a single entrance, uh, what happens is it's much slower. The bees are, are able to manage it too. But basically what happens is you still have the stack effect, but instead of the air venting out of the top, uh, it'll vent through the bottom. So as that warm, moist air cools, it, it starts dropping and, and then it starts going out, uh, eventually out the bottom. So one aha moment I had uh, this morning when I was just running some numbers is in a, a top vented uh, colony, especially in an insulated colony, the temperature at that entrance is really close to the warmest temperature in the box. So let's just say 20 Celsius. Uh, so it means that the driving force will be 20 Celsius, for example, right now, minus 15. So it'd be about 35 degrees uh, temperature difference would be what is driving that, that ventilation. Uh, so the reason I had the aha moment is I took my measurements uh, last night in my other colony and the lower entrance temperature was zero Celsius. So then I was like, huh... So the reason, because the the, the reason, the, the technically they follow the same uh, principles, so the stack and buoyancy effect, uh, but it, again, the temperature difference inside to outside is the same, so around 40 degrees or 35 Celsius to 40 degrees, depending on the temperatures, uh, but the actual outgoing air is actually driven by that zero celsius at the entrance so it's technically the difference now is minus tw is 20 degrees so you're like okay why do i care about these numbers so in the previous talks i talked about cluster driven enclosure driven when it's cluster driven the temperatures around that cluster are very close to the outside temperatures so it means that the bees will be releasing some heat from the top of that cluster uh, and hence the reason you need probably a lot of top ventilation if you want to go with that because uh, you're not insulated to, to get rid of that excess moisture and heat because uh, you'll get very little uh, stack effect it'll just be very localized around that top of that cluster that's releasing that uh, that warm humid air uh, even though despite the bees wanting to keep that warmth inside uh, they do need to breathe so they will release some of that heat out uh, but the temperature inside is very close to outside hence there's not much natural passive uh, ventilation in a non-insulated colony but when the colonies are enclosure driven, uh, the temperatures inside on average are much warmer than the outside temperature. And, and that's our driving force. Uh, that's what actually drives our ventilation in a very passive way. Uh, one thing I do mention is if you do insulate and you do top vent, you do want to manage uh, how big your your exits are or your entrances are uh, because it'll be a relationship between the bottom entrance and the top entrance uh, and we call it the effective uh, surface area of that entrance is what throttles or controls the airflow out of that uh, top entrance. So same principles, uh, but the driving force is a much higher temperature difference so there's the risk of actually uh, pulling a lot of excess heat out of that top entrance so if you do go with a bottom entrance uh, the reason sometimes it gets plugged up uh, with ice is uh, sometimes if your volume is too high if you like for example this case here uh, the temperature coming out of that entrance, uh, say in this colony on the side here, is around, I think, minus 5. Uh, and it's minus 15 outside, so it's only a temperature difference of 10. So it means that the driving force, and what I'll do is I'll share some, uh, some charts and some numbers on uh, what the maximum uh, 
airflow would be out of these entrances, and it'll give you an idea. One thing to remember is I'll, I'll show a picture just now on uh, what I've noticed is what I call vent channels. It's where the bees, the way they cluster, is they leave one of the open seams on one of the sides wide open uh, with no bees, and it all creates an open channel all the way to the bottom of the colony. Uh, so if the bees were to plug that, that from the top of the frames to the inner cover, uh, it's about uh, 18.25 inches or 46 centimeters uh, lengthwise by about a centimeter. Uh, so it'd take about 230 bees to plug that up. So if they wanted to throttle the air there, so you can see how a winter cluster might have 20,000 bees. So technically to manage the airflow in and out would take about uh, 250 bees and they could actually completely shut down the ventilation and block off a big large area of that uh, that uh, inside of the colony where the bees could actually maintain a much looser cluster. Because remember, uh, in these colonies here, the top insulation is around R40, which is probably f 10 times, f yeah, I'd say uh, a, a cluster might be able to do R5 to R9 uh, equivalent, uh, but that's with stress, where... For example, at R40 or 50 there, the bees, that surface area is way more manageable for bees. So they're actually able to incorporate it into their cluster. So it's a way to, to create microclimates inside their colonies. And you'll see some of these volumes that the bees uh, create are quite, uh, quite interesting. So we'll go from there. So let me check my notes. So just to recap, uh, so clusters, we talked about uh, enclosure versus uh, cluster driven. Literally, uh, the other aspect of bottom entrance only, it means that that moisture uh, vapor will condense out inside the box. So it means that all the energy in that moisture or that air will get uh, released inside the box as latent heat, which is good. Uh, most of our ventilation in winter is stack effect, so buoyancy. And it's just a light airflow, but uh, it's enough uh, for the bees to manage uh, their internal environment. In cluster, out of cluster, usually. Uh, so the bees can adjust and manage uh, throttle points by just blocking off uh, areas uh, to either release or hold back air. Insulation will actually reduce heat loss and stabilize the internal temperatures and make it warmer inside and nicer gradients. Uh, smaller volume colonies, so for example singles, uh, the bees will be able to maintain much warmer temperatures and ventilation uh, and moisture issues will be a lot less than in a big double, especially up here in the north. Single entrance, uh, I'll crunch the numbers, but I'm guessing around four centimeters by one centimeter is uh, probably plenty for most of us. Uh, anything less than that uh, might be risky, uh, especially in preventing uh, proper airflow so uh, bigger is better for dual entrances uh, typically I recommend no more than three quarter inch top uh, or about a centimeter by two centimeters so about what's a centimeter uh, three eighths or a half inch by uh, an inch about uh, Air exchange, even minimally, is enough to prevent. There's enough air movement in that box, uh, if it's well maintained, uh, to bring in, <coughs> excuse me, the oxygen required and remove the CO2. And I guess the goal is, uh, if you do want to do some monitoring, uh, I would recommend you put a lower entrance sensor. So I'd say put it about an inch on the inside. 
because uh, what that'll do is it'll actually let you understand your ventilation profile, especially for those that run bottom entrance only. Uh, and then you can charge that versus the outside temperature. And then you'll get an idea of how much uh, natural ventilation potential uh, that you have. So a lot of these principles, they follow, it's thermodynamics, but uh, we call it uh, psychrometry, so psychrometric processes. And that's where basically it's, it's what we use in HVAC. So heating, ventilation, and cooling. And uh, so literally the cluster of bees is your heating unit. Uh, but what they're doing is they're heating the air, but also adding moisture to the air. So... Uh, sometimes you want to heat the air and reduce the amount of humidity. But uh, I'd say in, in general for us uh, in winter, because it's cold, it's dry, uh, the bees need that moisture in the air to uh, to actually stay healthy and uh, to maintain a good balance. And uh, in a nutshell, I'd say that's, that's about all I have to say on ventilation. Uh, so what I'll do is I'll share... Uh, I will create an app where you can play around with different dimensions of entrances and different temperature profiles. Uh, that'll come hopefully in the next week or so. But the thing is, if you're going to insulate, uh, you can't half, I'd say a lot of times people, uh, so I'd say most of you just top ventilation or sorry, top insulation is good, uh, but you'll still require uh, a bit of top ventilation to manage some of the moistures, especially I'd say mid US because uh, your heat loss, your honey consumption so high there that uh, there's a lot of moisture to, to manage. So like I mentioned, these colonies here, will consume less honey than most of you in eight months of winter here, seven to eight months, than yours consume in, say, three months, four months. So literally a single, so these are doubles, so they'll consume about 40 pounds, 45, 45 to 50 pounds. A single measured in the past around about 30 pounds of honey consumed. So, uh, and that's from October. So, Pretty much last feed is mid-September. So from mid-September to uh, May uh, is that consumption. And I typically don't feed in the spring because uh, I don't have to because there's plenty of food left. So it just shows that uh, configuration does make a difference. And there are ways to, to manage that. So one reason probably I, that I don't have... Uh, I guess moisture issues is one it's the warmer inside climate so yeah just to finish off i'd say that's about it and what i'll do is i'll share my notes uh just so you have and i wrote an article too with this so it'll give you an idea of uh, of different things so anyways this is my second yard uh can't see the mountains today but uh it's all good and my hands friggin frozen cheers